What's up guys? So in this video, I'm going to be talking about the subconscious mind and the collective unconscious mind and archetypes. So if you don't know what that is, then you're in the perfect place. We're going to explore through these Jungian ideas and uh, let's just get into it. So uh, a lot of these are just quotes from Jung himself. So I'm going through um, using his words to do this presentation. Um, so I pulled this out of the Tavistock lectures that, I, uh, that he gave, I believe, in 1935. And if you would like to read up on them, they're in volume 18 of the collected works called The Symbolic Life. So we cannot deal with unconscious processes directly because they are not reachable. And so um, just a capstone on what we did in the last video, I made another video called Carl Jung, Consciousness, Ego and Personality Theory. Um, where I lay out what Jung um, kind of defines the parameters for analytical psychology. And one of those parameters is that we cannot directly analyze the contents of the unconscious mind, obviously, because it's unconscious. Um, so they're, they're not directly apprehended. They appear only in their products. So we're going to explore this a little further, so don't worry. And we postulate from the peculiar quality of those products that there must be something behind them from which they originate. We call that sphere the unconscious psyche. The unconscious processes then are not directly observable, but those of its products that cross the threshold of consciousness can be divided into two classes. So we've got the unconscious processes there. There's a threshold of consciousness and those, um, every now and again, the, the unconscious products um, produce, the unconscious processes produce products that cross the threshold of consciousness. And Jung here has classified them in two different classes. Um, and so as, a, as an analyst, as a psychological analyst, what we do is we observe we can only observe these products that have that are in our consciousness that came up from the unconscious realm and then what we do is we infer from the peculiar quality of those products um, we infer an understanding of the processes of the unconscious and what produced those products so let's get into Kind of what they are a little bit okay so the first class the first um, product uh, class of products contains recognizable material of definitely a personal origin these contents are individual acqu acquisitions or products of instinctive processes that make up the personality as a whole so we've got individual acquisitions right so Jung has in the personal unconscious acquisitions that you've um, acquired throughout your life. So it could be things that you've read, that you've heard. It could be experiences you've had, emotions you've felt, um, people you've met, ideas you've been exposed to, all the different things that you can experience in your life and, and, and acquire those experiences into your psyche. They're individual acquisitions. So you living your, your life, your personal history, that's your individual acquisitions, right? And then um, another thing that he says that is also in the personal unconscious is instinctive processes. Now, he doesn't really do a good job in these lectures of defining exactly what instinctive processes mean. And he doesn't really distinguish instinctive processes from um, when he's talking about the deeper level of the archetypes and the unconscious instinctive processes. So, but I think we can kind of understand this in a way of the individual conscious, the individual personal unconscious. Um, each person might have instinctive ways of being 
as an individual um, that is very characteristic of who they are as a person. Whereas when you see someone else, they might have another set of instinctive processes that they kind of live out uh, emotionally, verbally, ideation, like their ideation, um, the way they think. So, you know, different people have different instinctive tendencies, I guess, that are personal to them. So maybe that's what he meant there about the personal unconscious. So that's the first layer of the unconscious for Jung is the personal unconscious. Um, later on in the lecture, he actually says that some people are more conscious than others. So it's the personal unconscious he refers to as relative. And he states that some people are so conscious of all things that they can be conscious of that they basically make the personal unconscious go down to zero. So, um, you know, these people obviously are very introspective and so um, they understand their hidden motivations for things, they understand all the personal acquisitions they've had, they can understand their own instinctual processing uh, and, and they can intuitively understand other people and, and have a, a good perception of what's around them. And, but it's unclear as to why Jung actually believes that. Um, but I guess just through his personal experience, it seems like when you read his writings that um, he says such and such people can reduce their personal unconscious to zero. And, but yet a lot of people, he says, are um, very unconscious. They, they're unconscious of how they come across, they're unconscious of uh, how they're acting in the world, and they're very unconscious of their own motivations and behavior. So um, the personal unconscious is relative. Uh, then there's another class of contents, definitely with definitely unknown origin or, el or at all events of an origin which cannot be ascribed to individual acquisition. These contents have one outstanding peculiarity and that is their mythological character. It is as if they belong to a pattern, not peculiar to any particular mind or person, but rather to a pattern peculiar to mankind in general. So here he does a a good job of distinguishing between individual acquisitions like we talked about previously and these um, mythological these products of the unconscious that have a mythological character and that seem to be aligned with a general pattern that can be seen throughout um, the psyche in humanity so he distinguishes them. That's right. So the products of the collective unconscious are these mythological motifs or these collective patterns. And um, we're going to get into exploring how he kind of finds these patterns in dreams and, and mythological motifs and so forth. So, so he said, when I first came across such contents, I wondered very much whether they might not be due to heredity, and I thought they might be explained by racial inheritance. So in order to settle this question, Jung went to the United States and studied the dreams of pure-blooded African Americans and was satisfied that these images have nothing to do with so-called blood or racial inheritance nor are they personally acquired by the individual. So again, he's trying to create these parameters of investigation, okay, around dreams, around dream symbolism, around mythological motifs, and he's trying to get to the bottom of um, these, um, these general, this general pattern in, in the deeper layer of the unconscious psyche. So he's distinguishing it's not um, that these are personally acquired from the individual and it's not that these are uh, racially inherited. They seem to be 
They belong to mankind in general and therefore they are of a collective nature. So they belong, um, these patterns can be seen throughout all um, different cultures. The same patterns. So. so these collective patterns I have called archetypes using an expression of St. Augustine's. An archetype means a typos, imprint, a definite grouping of archaic character containing in form as well as in meaning mythological motifs. So an archetype is an imprint of a definite grouping of archaic character, which is basically um, mythological motifs that contains mythological motifs. Right. So um, myth mythological motifs appear in pure form in fairy tales, myths, legends, and folklore. Some of the well-known motifs are the figures of the hero, the redeemer, the dragon, and the whale, or the monster who swallows the hero. They have been referred to as a priori categories of imagination. So these archetypes, these archaic groupings um, of mythological motifs that have um, particular forms and meanings, they are a priori categories of imagination. They lay at the base of our, our psyche, the base of our, um, the structure of our psyche are these archetypes. And so um, uh, the base of the psyche is categorized into these archetypes that that um that can be seen across cultures. Now, this is a variation of the hero and dragon myth. Uh, so it's called the catabasis, uh, the descent into the cave, the neck year, and an example of um, this is in the Odyssey. U Ulysses and Odysseus descend. Uh, Ulysses is the Latin um, name for Odysseus, which is Greek. Uh, so Odysseus descends ad inferus to consult Tiresias the seer. So he goes down into the underworld and he uh, consults Tiresias the seer, and Tiresias tells him about the future, what's going to happen. He gives him some wise advice on what to do. And so uh, this motif of the Nekia is found everywhere in antiquity and particularly all over the world. It expresses the psychological mechanism of introversion of the conscious mind into the deeper layers of the unconscious psyche. So it's, you know, it's a mythological motif, but it, it can be Jung saying here that it, it shows the psychological mechanism of introversion. So the conscious mind is going deep into the unconscious layers of the psyche, right? And so um, it's experiencing the, the mythological language and, and wisdom that comes from that, um, those layers of the psyche. And so uh, the catabasis is, so go here, uh, the, the Nekia in ancient Greek is a cult practice in, in cult practice and literature. Um, it's the right by which ghosts were called up and questioned about the future. And so, so i.e. Ne necromancy. Uh, and the Nekia is not necessarily the same thing as the catabasis, while both afford the opportunity to conserve converse with the dead. Only a catabasis is the actual physical journey to the underworld undertaken by several heroes in Greek and Roman myth. And so, um, but what Jung here is saying is that um, that those mythological stories are showing the process of introversion, of psychological introversion, when the, the dreamer, the conscious person, is going deep into the psyche. So I had a dream um, a few months ago now of that I beat all these people in some game and then all of a sudden I was in this uh, 
this room with marble floor and this dragon mouth opened up to me and the dragon mouth was a portal to hell and I had like a respectful fear of going into the portal but I knew that I wanted to go into the dragon's mouth to go down to hell to do what I needed to do and so that dream appeared to me before I actually read about this uh, Nakia and Catabasis from Jung and so it was around the period though when I was getting into Jung and so my mind was obviously um, ready and willing to go into the unconscious. My conscious mind was willing to explore the unconscious. And so that's what I think that that dream means. Uh, and that's what Jung is kind of talking about here. Um, so from these layers derive the contents of an impersonal mythological character. In other words, the archetypes. And I call them therefore the personal collective unconscious. And that there's just a Greek sculpture of the head of um, Odysseus. Okay, so another mythological motif and symbol is the sun wheel. The sun wheel is an exceedingly archaic idea, perhaps the oldest religious idea there is. We can trace it to the Mesolithic and Paleolithic ages as the sculptures of Rhodesia prove. Now there were real wheels only in the Bronze Age. In the Paleolithic Lithic Age, the wheel was not yet invented. But this image is not a naturalistic one, for it is always divided into eight, four or eight petitions. As you can see there, it's like a circle with lines through it, right? Um, but isn't that amazing? This image um, is actually seen well before the actual wheel was uh, discovered or, or invented, I might say. Um, but actually, around this time, this wheel is a contemporary to lots of other naturalistic images. So back in that, that, that period, the Paleolithic period, there were images of other naturalistic kinds. So humans back then obviously um, made images of animals interacting with other animals and so forth. Um, so they would be naturalistic. Uh, it's posited that the sun wheel is probably obviously a de derivative, uh, like an archetypal image of the sun. Um, but, but the fact that it has lines through it makes it not a naturalistic image anymore. It's, it's a, um, yeah, because it's, it's got four to eight petitions. So it's a symbol in the mind, so to speak. Um, and Jung says here, we might assume that the invention of the actual wheel started from this vision. Many of our inventions came from mythological anticipations and primordial images. For instance, the art of alchemy is the mother of modern chemistry. Our conscious scientific mind started in the matrix of the unconscious mind. And so um, I think that that's quite profound there. And so um, Jung, when Jung investigated those African-American dreams, um, one, one such person he investigated uh, had a dream of a man who was being crucified on a wheel. And so Jung posited that, well, his religious history, which would be um, at that time in America closest to Christianity, his dream should have consisted of a man being sacrificed on a cross, not a wheel. And so little did um, this African-American at the time know um, that his dream is actually a well-known mythological, um, Greek mythological motif, the motif of Ixion. And so Jung posits that basically it's very unlikely that this uh, African American would have, at that time, this is you know before 1930, would have had exposure to Greek mythology, especially um, Ixion, because Ixion was quite a, um, you know, it wasn't like the most well-known mythological 
Greek story. Um, but Jung obviously understanding and having the knowledge of Greek mythology was able to piece these things together. So that's how he came to the conclusion that these archetypes were not um, racially inherited because um, they were seen across cultures. And so in, um, you know, his African heritage wouldn't have given him the mythological motif that aligns with um, in, in Greek mythology, for example. Um, so this symbology um, was a burst straight from the unconscious layers of the psyche. And uh, the Greek mythological motif of Ixion, uh, basically what happens there is uh, Zeus banishes, banishes Ixion um, forever to be um, crucified on a wheel for all eternity, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that's a pretty horrible fate there. Uh, and basically, um, Jung posits somewhere that um, mythology was a projection of the archetypes. So it was a projection of this underlying structure of the collective psyche. Uh, and that's how these myths occurred. And that's why um, they occur in people, modern day people's dreams, as well as in these, this mythological, in these mythological stories. So, dream analysis in analytical psychology involves making parallels between mythological patterns and the unconscious products of dreams. There are mythological patterns in the deep layers of the unconscious that produce contents which cannot be ascribed to the individual and which may even be in strict contradiction to the personal psychology of the dreamer. So it's about the making parallels. So um, basically Jung, uh, I think he did some research and um, he found this uh, mythological motif of, um, of Professor Dietrich, I don't know how to say his name, uh, in 1910. Um, and there was a translation of um, this um, this sun image of the sun controlling the wind, uh, emanating wind uh, from the pipe or a tube hanging from the sun. And so that was some mythological motif. motif. And uh, he also found records of a schizophrenic who was often in his uh, sessions talking about how the sun emitted the wind out of a phallus, out of its own phallus. So it's the similar symbolism. So you think that that, that schizophrenic would be crazy um, until you've done the research into the parallels between, say, a schizophrenic vision or dreams compared to um, these mythological patterns that we find throughout history, these historic uh, parallels. Um, so it is really quite simple to explain. Our mind has its history just as our body has its history. Our unconscious mind, like our body, is a storehouse of relics and memories of the past. There is nothing mystical about the collective unconscious. It is just a new branch of science, and it is really common sense to admit the existence of unconscious collective processes. For though a child is not born conscious, his mind is not a tabula rasa, a blank state, slate. The mind has been built up in the course of millions of years and represents a history of which it is the result. Naturally, it carries with it the traces of that history, exactly like the body. And if you grope down into the basic into the basic structure of the mind, you naturally find traces of the archaic mind. So, the deepest we can reach in our exploration of the unconscious mind is the layer where man is no longer a distinct individual, but where his mind winds out and merges into the mind of mankind. Not the conscious mind, but the unconscious mind of mankind where we are all the same. 
The outstanding fact about the primitive mentality is this lack of distinctiveness between individuals, this oneness of the subject with the object, this participation mystique. Primitive mentality expresses the basic structure of the mind, that psychological layer which with us is the collective unconscious, that underlying level which is the same in all. Because the basic structure of the mind is the same in everybody, we cannot make distinctions when we experience on that level. There, we do not know if something has happened to you or to me. So Jung actually must like this idea because he, he talked about it in the Tavistock Lectures in 1935, but also in his semi-autobiographical book um, called Memories, Dreams and Reflections. He talks about how he often growing up would sit on this rock and think about the distinction between himself and the rock and was there really a distinction between them and and, and all that stuff. Um, so he obviously likes this idea um, of the collective unconscious um, being the layer at which we all share in um, and there's no distinction in, in that layer of the unconscious mind. Its presumable contents, so talking about the collective unconscious and the archetypal mind, its presumable contents appear in the form of images, which cannot be understood only by comparing them, which can only be understood by comparing them with historical parallels. If you do not recognize certain material as, 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 as historical, and if you do not possess the parallels, you cannot integrate these contents into consciousness, and they remain projected. So, the contents of the collective unconscious are not subject to any arbitrary intention and are not controlled by the will. They actually behave as if they did not exist in yourself. You see them in your neighbours, but not in yourself. So, Jung there is basically um, talking about projection. So, it's quite interesting listening to his ideas about projection, but in relationship to the archetypes. In relationship to the unconscious because he's basically saying that the whole point of analytical psychology is to integrate these con these contents these mythological contents into consciousness so the, this a priori structure that lays at the base of our psyche we're meant to integrate that from our unconscious from the collective unconscious into our consciousness so that we can not then just uh, be, you know, instruments of the unconscious, but then we make them conscious so that we can um, not just be puppeteers, so to speak, of what's going on underneath our consciousness. And so um, if you don't do that, he's saying that then you will only see them in other people, you know. Um, and so what you really want to do is get them in your consciousness um, and I think that doesn't sound like any easy task. It sounds like we're going to have to do a deep study of mythology, really. Um, and I, I don't mind doing that. I think in the future I'm going to do that as I go and study Jung more and more and more. But um, I can imagine that uh, this is no easy task. And I guess this is um, the outline or the beginning of uh, what Jung would call individuation. Uh, so, yes, so thank you guys for, I'll leave it at that point because um, that leaves us with something positive to do to integrate the unconscious with the conscious. And so if you like this video, then please subscribe. I will be uh, releasing some more videos on Jung as I continue to read his work. And it's been very interesting for me to discover all these different ideas that he's talked about and the different research he's done. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you in the next video.